we've now got our tenor, so we're complete. Mm-hmm. Um, sit where you're comfortable, and and then when it's time to sing, uh, just come up. Okay. Are you are you comfortable doing that? Sorry. Well, hey, hey, Sharma, the the one is a clip that you can just clip on your collar. You see, see what I'm saying? So you don't have to wear the ear thing. People generally see that's the ear thing. And that one. And then you know how to turn that on, Sharla. Just, just that big button there. Power mute. Yeah, power mute. Turn that on and just press on it. And when you get green, you're on. Okay. And
it's not horrible, but I'm picking it up, yeah. Good morning. Good to be with you as we've come together and worship uh, to get to worship again on Sunday morning in the midst of our COVID climate. But uh, hey, it's all good, and it's good to see all of you here and some who are going to be coming in. And anyway, the what we're going to do? Let's get started by standing and turning in our blue hymnal. And singing together, Come Thou Fount, number 521 in the blue hymnal. I'm going to call our singers to come forward to help lead us. Let's stand and sing. Come thou fount of every blessing, take my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it. God's own chosen, changing love. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I'm come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger 
wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Thank you. You may be seated. Good to be with you this morning. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a few moments just to um, offer a word of greetings. Being with you is, um, is just really a privilege for me. And sometimes I don't know if I express that enough, but it is. And it's good to see all of you here. And in a few minutes, we're going to be welcoming uh, our friends who are webcasting. Um, so some announcements that I would like to share with you, maybe some prayer concerns. Let's start with announcements. The main announcement is today that I just encourage you to take a look at the bulletin and see the items that are in there. Note that uh, there are sermon notes provided if you would like to follow along. Uh, um, fill in the blanks. That's provided for you as well. You'll also notice on the back cover, and we'll be participating in the call to worship that is provided there by a good brother of mine named Jim Aby. Uh, I was glad to see his name uh, on, on our bulletin this week as the one who prepared the call to worship. There are three prayer concerns that I would like to share and lift, with you, uh, lift up to you today. The first one is one that we have uh, uh, been uh, concerned about, and I just want to encourage us to keep Remember to keep Joanne and Steve Tuttle in our prayers. Joanne has been diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor, and uh, it does not look good for Joanne in the long term. However, we um, received pictures uh, from Steve and Joanne this week, and she, was, she and Steve were with grandchildren, and Joanne looked wonderful. And so... Um, uh, we just want to continue to hold them up, uh, their family, uh, their children, uh, Paul and John and Amanda and Josh. Keep them all in our prayers, all right? The second, um, the second prayer concern that I would like to lift to you is really uh, some friends of mine in Hutchinson. He, uh, uh, Matt and Anita Christian, Matt and Anita are, are colleagues of mine, and um, um, I called Anita the other day, and we were going to be talking, and it was that day that um, Matt's fa sister had been found dead, uh, and, and that was quite a shock to their family. Um, we don't know any details, but um, I, I would ask that you just keep Matt and Anita Christian in your prayers. Wonderful people, great brother and sister, and I I would ask that we would hold them up. The third today is Erwin Porter. And Erwin has gone into the hospital. He's been having some problems with his right hip. So I'd ask that you keep Erwin in prayer. And actually, I was looking forward to this Sunday because Erwin and I were talking earlier this week. The, the, a lot of you saw this. Isn't that great? Yeah, okay, Brad, up, Brad and Carol up there. Well, you know, this is just something of, of one of the wonderful things that um, decorate Irwin's past. He, he was a toyman. And uh, so what I'm going to do, for those of you who haven't seen it, and just to celebrate it, we're going to put this uh, up on the bulletin board. And, um, you know, if you think, uh, think about it, keep Irwin in prayer and also... Just kind of giving thanks for a very creative man that we've had in our midst all these years. So, we celebrate that. Yes? You have the doll. 
Okay, you, you know what? You know what would be neat? You ought to take it over and show him. Have you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, yes, indeed. And that is timey tell, right? Okay, well, Doreen has a time, she was just saying she has a timey tell doll. It was one of Irwin's uh, brainchild, so good for you. All right, wonderful. Okay, that's great. Are there any announcements that you have that you would like to lift up or share today? Yes. He is. He is here in Quinter. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, Bob. That's right. The cereal boxes at the library. Okay, go check out the cereal boxes and see what you grew up eating. Do you have any, do you have any Cocoa Puffs? you have an empty Cocoa Puff there? Captain Crunch? No, Captain? You're serious, and you've got the... Okay. All right. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Some of, some, of the, some of the athletes, and yes. Okay. 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 All right. Very good. All right. Good. Well, hey, Bob, thank you for that. And folks... Hey, take a trip downtown and look at cereal boxes, okay? Yes, honey. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Are there others? Yes, Don. Thank you. That's going to be a biggie. Yes. We actually, and, 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 and really glad you brought that up, uh, Don, because we did have, there was a group of folks that met in front of the grade school uh, earlier this week where we just had prayer together from from uh, our various congregations in the community. And uh, that's something we do want to continue to hold up, so very much appreciated, Don. Thank you. Um, one other thing I lift up as a joy, if you look at who is back with us, Kathy. Yay! <laughs> of course, of course she, part of Kathy's problem is she, she can't keep from popping buttons. Because of that, that granddaughter, Sloan. Congratulations. That's exciting. Yeah. Yes, Sharon. Yes. That is a real praise. Sharon was able to be with her siblings and visiting her mom this week. Isn't that cool? Yay! Lots of good stuff. That's right. All right. Get an amen from the mezzanine. There we go. All right. Very good. Thank you much. Okay. Well, hey, let's, um, let's get together with our theme for today. And, and um, in worship, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be talking about rocks. And it just so happened when um, I was out in the front yard today at the church, I went outside and found this. And, and you know, I started thinking about this, and, you know, a couple of things that, that rocks suggest, the image of a rock suggests is, number one, it's been around a long time. I'll bet this rock is older than this church. What do you think, this church building? And that means it's older than any of us, perhaps with the exception of Bob. No, no, I'm just kidding, Bob. 
<laughs> older than dirt. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, this, this rock has been here a long time, and it's going to be around a lot longer than any of us are going to be. Would you all agree to that? Okay. And the second thing about a rock and what it might symbolize is that rocks symbolize hardness, strength, right? In fact, we have a term today, um, uh, people who are interested in, in bodybuilding or, or, or trying to get in shape and fitness, and the term is get chiseled. In fact, that's the title of the message. Now, if I say that guy is really chiseled, do you know what, we, we would know what I'm talking about, right? No? Yeah? Say, say, yeah sure you do. Now, guys, it's okay to go, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, you get it, you get it. You know, feed the pastor just a little bit and help him keep on his feet. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so to get chiseled, you have to work out to make that body hard and strong. So today we're going to be talking about what it is to be a people that are hewn from rock by God. God the sculptor, God the creator, and God the creator of all things, even a people which, as Isaiah tells us, and we're going to be reading about, who hews his people, chisels his people, forms his people from a rock which is lasting and strong. I want you to notice up on the, um, on the screen today, there is a picture of Michelangelo's David. And Michelangelo, of course, was the great sculptor of the Renaissance. And Michelangelo said this, in every block of marble, I see a statue. I have only to hew away the rough walls that imprison the, lo the lovely apparition to reveal it. Okay? And that's who we are and what God is to us. He carves, he chisels, he forms something that he brings forth that's already there. That's who we are as his people. And I think that's something to be thankful for. I think that's a pretty positive thing, right? Okay, well with that, I'm going to ask that we prepare to enter into this time of worship. Kathy's going to provide just a little bit of music to, um, to lead us into this time, after which we'll begin by singing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I'm going to ask us now, if we would, to take our blue hymnals, turn to number 143. And for the folks, our brothers and sisters who have joined us by webcast, this is a pretty familiar one, and I'll bet you can sing it right where you're at with us. It's Amazing Grace, and what we're going to do is we're going to sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 6. So let's stand and let's sing together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved Grace that taught 
Mm. Thank you. And I'm going to ask now that you take your bulletin, turn to the back, and join with me in the responsive reading. Here are four points, a pastor's dream and a parishioner's dread. But the prophet speaks for the Lord with words that touch our hearts. Listen to me, look to the rock, look to Abraham and to Sarah, the Lord will comfort. God speaks, we hear the words, and righteousness prevails. Listen to me, you that seek the Lord. Wise people do not focus on the sands of time. We are created in, it, in God's image, and we point to the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ, daily. Look to the rock from which you were hewn. The faithfulness of these two saints of old can bring blessings to many, even through us. Look to Abraham, your forefather, and to Sarah, your foremother. In our times of travail comes the comforting truth of God's presence. The Lord will comfort, gladness will be found. This message has a profound effect on those who follow it daily. Listen to the Lord. Behold the Lord's work. Do we hear God's message for us? Listen and look, the Lord is at hand. And please pray with me. We give you thanks, gracious God, for this day where we again meet together in this place. For those who are joining us by way of webcast, we pray your blessing upon this time. And may we take with us this day a sense of assurance that goes with us in all circumstances as you are the one to whom we cleave, the rock of our salvation, the hope of our life, the comfort for all our days, which is lasting and certain. And so we look to you and thanking you, we do so in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Now, as we consider the scripture this morning, I want you to uh, pay attention to what we have on the screen. It's, it's a little synopsis of a town, an ancient city called Caesarea Philippi. It gives a little background to our New Testament message today. So please listen. To the north of Israel, near Dan, in a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now this is a large archaeological site containing elaborate building projects by Herod Philip and Herod the Great's grandson, Agrippa II. Heard it's supposed to rain today. In addition to magnificent Roman structures, Caesarea Philippi is also known for Banyas, a collection of springs and pagan worship sites linked to the cult of Pan. Pan, also called the goat god, was the Greco-Roman god of nature, livestock, and hunting. All things related to wild times, party music, and of course, fertility. Pan was the crazy looking guy with the hindquarters, legs, and horns of a goat. The centerpiece of this ancient worship site is this huge cliff and grotto containing the remains of numerous altars, caves, temples and courtyards. This whole area was teeming with Roman mythology and idolatry. It was right here where Jesus, nearing the end of his ministry, asked his disciples one profound question, who do you say that I am? Okay, just a little background on 
one of, I think, the most marked and significant events in, in the story of Jesus, and we're going to be reading about it in just a moment, in Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus and his disciples head out of the territory of Judea, and they go north, and they stand before the city of Caesarea Philippi. And you heard that Caesarea Philippi was a pagan city. And the rock that was before them was both enormous and, and very pretentious, and it was reflecting the worship and the ways of the world at that time, particularly in the worship of the god Pan of Roman mythology. Jesus brings them to the point, and they have a wonderful discussion, and ultimately the confession of Peter. Think about the imagery of that rock, of the city they're standing before, in light of now these words that we'll read together from the 16th chapter of Matthew, beginning in verse 13. Now when Jesus came to, into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Just kind of think about that for a while in light of what we saw. And what we'll do at this time is turn in our red hymnal to number 263 and sing one that we haven't sung for a while, but I think goes well with what we're talking about today. Be still, my soul. Let's remain seated as we sing. Thy heavenly friend. 
Thank you. As I said, that's one we haven't sung for a while. How many, how many of you remember that one? Don't remember it. Oh, my. You know, I was, I was telling uh, these good sisters who came in and uh, uh, helped with singing today that um, um, when I first came into the Church of the Brethren at the Antelope Park Church in Lincoln, that uh, we were still using, at that point, the red hymnal, and um, that, that hymn uh, was a real staple of that congregation. And it's one that I've, uh, I've loved over the years. And, and I, if I have a complaint about the blue hymnal, which I love our blue hymnal, but I wish, I wish that one were in there. It's, it's, a, it's just a marvelous, wonderful hymn, uh, put to, words put to the uh, 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 music of Sibelius. Is Finlandia. Yeah, Finlandia. That's right. Okay. Well, hey, as we continue with our theme today, and I think things are starting to unfold a little bit in, in what we've sung and, and the responsive reading and talking about rocks and, and, and that those, those images that, that, you know, come from that, I would like for you to listen to someone who many of you may be familiar with. Now, this this particular video is about 10 years old, but it's by Rabbi Harold Kushner, okay? And, and you know, the amazing thing about it is, though it's been around for a while, how very relevant it is for us today. So I'm going to ask Brad to play this, and then we'll hear this in light of Isaiah and kind of go from there, okay? So take a listen. I think it's good stuff. A man came up to me after one of my lectures and said to me, you seem to know your Bible. Can you tell me what one sentence does God repeat more often than any other in the Bible? I thought for a moment and I said, I believe it's the one about being kind to the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. He shook his head, not even close. The answer is, don't be afraid. I went home and looked it up. It turned out he was right. More than 80 times, God tells someone, don't be afraid, usually translated as fear not. He says it to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. He says it four times to Joshua in his first speech to him after the death of Moses. He says it to each of the prophets and tells them to say it to the people in his name. In the New Testament, Jesus repeatedly admonishes his disciples not to be afraid. And you may remember, those are the angel's first words to Mary. Why all this emphasis on not being afraid? Because there are a lot of things out there to frighten us. And the more frightened we are, the worse job we will do to cope with our fears. Fear distorts our ability to think clearly, to evaluate risks. How often do election campaigns try not so much to persuade us of the advantages of one candidate, but to frighten us of the consequences of electing his opponent? That fear keeps us from analyzing the election rationally. Whenever there's a plane crash with loss of life, thousands of people who are planning to fly decide to drive instead, even though the chances of being hurt or killed in a car crash are much higher than in a plane crash. Fear shrinks our souls, making us more selfish, less charitable, less idealistic. Being afraid diminishes our humanity. I can believe that God is disappointed with Adam in the opening pages of Genesis, not so much because he ate the forbidden fruit as because his first words to God were, I was afraid. How do we cope with the things that scare us? How do we remain vigilant, alert to danger without letting the fear take over our souls? and render us less than we might be. To take one example that's on the mind of a lot of people, we're concerned, and properly so, about another terrorist attack on the United States, like the one on 9-11. Most of what can be done to prevent an attack will have to be done by governments. But there are some things we can do, and just one thing we can do that would be wrong. We need to understand that the real targets of terrorists are not the people they kill, but the people they frighten. 
Terrorist math is simple. Kill one person and you frighten a hundred. Kill a thousand people and you frighten an entire population. Do you remember the DC sniper of a few years ago? One man with a rifle and a teenage accomplice was able to shut down virtually the entire Washington, Maryland area because of the random nature of his killings. You never knew where he would strike next, so people were afraid to go anywhere. Okay. Very good. <laughs> All right. I don't know about you, but I think that's a little prophetic. What do you think? Think about it. I want you to hear if there if you're you're gonna be hearing quite a few things today. But if you can take away these words with you, do not fear or fear not you will have gotten the gist of what we're about today. Okay? All right. Here are these words from the prophet Isaiah. Listen to me, you that, seek, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation, for a teaching will go out from me, and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people who have my teaching in your hearts. Do not fear the reproach of others, and do not be dismayed when they revile you, for the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my deliverance will be forever, and my salvation to all generations. Lord, today as we gather and as we worship, help us to know our, assur our assurance and our hope and our comfort is in you, in you who brings deliverance and salvation for this day and for all days to come. Fix us there. Amen. Well, I don't think it's saying too much that we are really living in a time that could be described, among other things, as a time of fear. It's, it's, it's a scary time. Um, and, and we hear about that fear in the media, um, we can talk to friends and neighbors, and we can feel the weight of fear, that sense of unknown and what's going to happen next. Um, even uh, with the current pandemic, we um, um, wear masks 
and, and we do so. And there is even that sense of fear underlining that wearing of masks. What might happen if we don't do that? And, and, um, and, and while it's, it uh, uh, can be argued that it is a good thing, and I certainly don't want to discourage that, but just being reminded that there is fear that, that's at the root of a lot of this. Is it, is it something that is, um, is, is, it, is it a fear that um, has grounding? Of course. I mean, this, this I, I just talked to a friend of mine who recently got over a bout of COVID, and he's doing well. But still, that fear of, of, of getting that particular virus. And that's all around us. We also see it in other events, events that are taking place in our nation. And we've talked about that in terms of what's happening in the cities. And I think it's very interesting that Rabbi Kushner in this video was talking about elections and how elections, uh, whether, whether you're on uh, the, the Democratic side or on the Republican side, there's a lot of fear uh, that, is, that is used to vote for your particular person because, after all, what might happen if the other person gets in? All right? Fear. We live in fear today. In the presence and the power of an unseen enemy, certainly in this pandemic. And what, there, are, there are four things that I'm noticing in this atmosphere of fear that we're living in. Number one, fear produces lethargy. And I see it. Uh, I've, in talking to some of my other colleagues and listening to what's happening in their respective congregations, and, it's, and it just becomes heavy because we're not doing what we normally do, and we're not in routine, and we're not in rhythm. And, and so the response to that begins with lethargy. It's kind of become kind of ah, heavy. And lethargy produces, secondly, apathy. You get to the point where, where the fear becomes so consuming, we just don't care anymore. Whatever. I love it. I love it. It's great. Apathy. I don't love apathy. But I'm really happy that James is here. Cheering me on. Show him how it's done, James. All right. The third aspect is lethargy and apathy that leads to depression. One of the things, folks, that I'm very concerned about throughout this pandemic and all that's happened with what's taking place today is increasing And I talk to folks about this in phone conversations. Uh, and I'm not talking now only to uh, uh, folks who sit in the pews, but even colleagues of mine that I'm meeting with and dealing then with other situations that are coming up as a way of life in the midst of this pandemic, and it just makes it all that much more difficult. And there is depression, and it's increasing. And I'm very concerned about that, where this is going to come out, not only with regard to our physical health, but emotional, mental, and, of course, spiritual health as well. The fourth thing, agitation. Lethargy, apathy, depression, and agitation. And we are living in a very agitated time because of this fear. It's contributing to it in a, in a big way. And, uh, you know, you've been hearing my haranguing about social media. Well, I, 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 folks, the reason why I'm saying what I'm saying about social media isn't because social media in and of itself is a bad thing. But there's not a lot of edifying 
or maybe there's a need for more edifying on social media rather than people trying to beat one another up and, and trying to, to um, assert their positions. Very concerned. We, we live in a very agitated way, and guess what agitation produces? More agitation, right? You get agitated, you're, you know, and then this over here and this person responds like this, and pretty soon you've got people, and they're, they're all amped up. I think it's time to just turn it down. But that's fear. It's all the product of fear. So today, and whether you're here in the sanctuary or to friends who are sitting at home and watching by way of webcast, please take this to heart. The words of Isaiah, penned so many years ago, but are so very relevant and I think needed for us today. Today, listen to what and how, uh, today, what to the, here we're going to listen to what and how to hear in the, uh, this in the face of our fears. We're going to listen to what we need to be listening to and hearing in the face of our fears. So, I'm, I'm tur I've turned to Isaiah 51. Let me get that out right. And, and you'll notice that this opening passage in the 51st chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 through 8, is really a poem in three stanzas. And it's written, given to a people facing an unknown future, a future of fear. Many unknowns are before this people. I think there are people returning from exile, from a, from a place a place where they had been coming back to their land, and yet there's a lot of uncertainty that comes with that. So in the first stanza of the poem, we hear the words of Isaiah that begin with, Listen. Listen to me, my people. Give heed to me, my nation. For a teaching will go out from me, I beg your pardon, I'm down in verse 4. Go back to verse 1. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. Got ahead of myself there a little bit. Listen. And the word for listen there is the word shema. Shema. It is to listen with consideration. Give thought to what it is that I'm telling you. Today, let's listen and hearken or give thought to these words from Isaiah. The word shema is the opening word to the great prayer of the Hebrew people. Moses gave it to him in the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy when he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And Jesus later expanded on that prayer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. Shema. Listen to this. Give thought. Give consideration. Think about it. Reflect on it. To, and this is written to a people pursuing righteousness and seeking the Lord. And God's response to them is what? First stanza, his faithfulness. God is faithful. The first stanza in the message, as Isaiah tells them to listen, he then says, look to the past. Look to the past. What God has done. 
He has, he has hewn this people from a rock. He's created them from the originators of this people, Abraham and Sarah. God was faithful, and he was faithful bringing about that promise that he made to Abraham initially, that I am going to make you the father of many nations, and I am going to bless the world through you. Did God keep his promise? Absolutely. God's faithfulness in the past validates his promise for the present and the future. So this hewn rock to Abraham and Sarah all speaks to God's lasting hope, beauty, comfort, and faithfulness. It's there. Well, how does this speak to us now? Well, for us now, we might ask, what is it that God will do? Well, as God did then, so he continues to do today, and he will do. He will comfort because he is faithful. When we talk about faith in the Christian church, so oftentimes we talk about the importance of our faith. But we also need to reflect on God's faithfulness. God is faithful to his promises. And God not only acted in the past, he will continue to act in the present and in the future. That's the first stanza. The second stanza. Believe it or not, in verse 4, and that's where I was in the first place, yep, that's the second stanza. It begins with the word listen. But there's a different word. It's not shema. It's the word shab. And that means prick up your ears. Or, this is good preacher talk. Pay attention. Pay attention. He's not scolding them, by the way. Pay attention now. And, and, and what Isaiah is saying is, now I want you to, to pay attention and to hear what you are called to do and who you are called to be as my people. So in the first place, when Isaiah opens this poem to those who are pursuing righteousness and seeking the Lord, and God's response to them is faithfulness, now in this second stanza, this is to a people waiting on God. And God's response to them is salvation. It's deliverance. You've been set free. It's a teaching by the way, the word for teaching is Torah. This is the Lord's Torah of justice for all peoples, God's salvation and rule for all peoples through those whom he has called. Note the calling. This is to be a people that, that are called to make known to pay attention to a swift and lasting deliverance and salvation. And God is saying, I want you to make that known. By the way, you think that still applies today? Yes. Church, why are we here? There it is. And this is for us now. Well, we might say, how long? is this salvation, and how long is this deliverance, and how long will this last? And, and God's salvation is a forever salvation. Spoken to a people who are so used to temporal answers and Band-Aid fixes. By the way, can we identify? Yeah, folks, we face it all the time, every four years. Sorry, I'm not knocking anybody. I'm just telling you that's the way it is. And so it has been throughout history with leaders that have promised to put everything right. I'm not knocking the pro political process. 
But I am concerned at this point that more Christians, I, I was going to talk about this a little bit later, but since I'm here, I'm just going to go here. And more Christians can talk about Donald Trump or they can talk about Joe Biden or the evils of one or the other than they can Jesus Christ. Now that's got me, that's got me puzzled. Because if Christ is our King and if Christ is our Lord, why am I not talking about Him? As the one through whom God is giving the world a forever deliverance, salvation, hope, assurance. This is a message to a people whom God has called, and may we find ourselves here as a people who have a forever message. The third stanza. Well, guess what word it begins with again? And this is how we know that this is a poem. It has three stanzas, and it begins with the word, listen. Thank you. Listen. Back to the word Shema, which is to listen with consideration, give thought. And it's spoken to those who know righteousness, who know the right. And God's response? Well, what did we hear from Rabbi Kushner? Do not fear. You know me. You know my, what I'm about. You know the right way. Do not fear. Or, if I were reading from the King James, I kind of like it. Fear not. Fear not. Do not fear or fear not. So the third stanza of this message is, is given to those whose hearts uh, are filled with God's teaching, where God's Torah resides. He tells them, do not fear. In the first stanza, we said, note the imagery the rock from which they were hewn and, and the story of Abraham and Sarah to which they belong. In the second stanza, it was, note their calling, for they were a called out people. In this stanza, note the assurance. Take courage in God's lasting deliverance and salvation. By the way, Rabbi Kushner was right. The most repeated phrase in all of Scripture is, do not fear. And it's said over 80 times, out of context, or if you put it, take it out of that context, uh, some find it even said 365 times. But in context, in what we're talking about today, 80 times. Now, let me ask you something. If God says something 80 times, do you think it's worth listening to? I mean, given, given the fact of who's saying it and, and, and then the message, and if he's telling us, if he's telling the people then, do not fear, do you think the message has changed today? I'm just going to tell you, folks, I think in the church, we're, we're, we're afraid. Why? Why? Look to our God. Look to our Christ again. May not the moment bind us and hamper us and imprison us with fear. So who is this for? It's for us. And it's interesting that we know that particularly in the words of Isaiah when Isaiah, in speaking for God, says this is for all generations. It's there. Verses 7 and 8, take a look at it. It's there. For all generations, do not fear. And by the way, this is something that we Americans living in the 21st century don't like to hear today, but do not fear comes as a way of imperative. What's an imperative? 
It's a command. So God is commanding his people, do not, we don't like commands. Well, I'm telling you anyway, do not fear. That's a command. That's an imperative. In other words, if God says it, and he says, don't do it, don't do it. Don't fear. Now, is that a good command or a bad command? That's a good command, isn't it? Think God is looking out for us when, he's held, when he commands us, do not fear? I think so. So, those three stanzas, just reemphasizing the message that comes from each. In the first stanza, what God will do, God will comfort because God is faithful. In the second stanza, for how long? God's salvation is a forever salvation. God is not a God of temporal uh, or temporality. He, he is a God of forever, with a forever message that he calls us also to share. And the third stanza, who is this for? God's deliverance is for all generations. Do not fear. Now, I want to speak to this very, very quickly in light then of that second scripture that we talked about this morning, and that's when Jesus was with the disciples before the city of Caesarea Philippi and before that great rock which, which, upon which that city was built. And this city was, it, it, it had indentions in that rock where the, uh, where the idols and statues of Pan and other gods were placed in the rock. So you knew what that city was about. And when, when Jesus asked the disciples, who do the people say that I am? And Peter finally answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus responds to him and says, Peter you are Peter. You are rock. That's what Peter means. Petros. You are rock. And on this Petra, this rock, I will build my church. Where is this church going to be built? In the middle of this, of this pagan zone. And what does he say? And the gates of hell or Hades won't prevail against it. Can't deal with it. By the way, you think Jesus was right? 2,000 years later, where's Caesarea Philippi? You saw it. Where is it? It's in ruins. Did you notice that? I bet there are not any, many people walking around today saying, well, I'm a, I'm a citizen of Caesarea Philippi. I didn't. What do you think? You think you can surmise that? How about, how about Christ's church? It's alive and well, folks. Despite appearances to the contrary. It's alive and well. Jesus keeps his promise. That's a rock. That's our rock. That supplies. From which we are cut from formed and shaped from. And rock, in that sense, it's forever. It's forever. It's lasting. Strong. That's for us today. So, two things I want to finish up with. Our response to all of this is what? Well, I, I had to be cute. Um, and so, I say, get chiseled. Church, it's time to get chiseled. And now I'm, I'm bringing one of my favorite pastimes into this because if anybody knows me, you'll know that I love to work out. And, and I make no apologies about this. You'll ask me, Pastor, what do you do during the day? Well, I'll come into the study, and from 8 to 12, 8.30 to 12, I work and, and do worship preparation. I'm making phone calls. I'm doing some administrative stuff in the, in, in the study. I'm talking to uh, people in the district. I'm doing all that in-office work. Cindy, is that right? See, talk to Cindy. She knows. Uh, all right. Here's the second thing. At noon or about 12.30, guess what I do? What do you do? You go to lunch. 
I head over to the fitness center or go downstairs. And I'm, and I'm lifting and I'm working out and I'm doing all, well, I'm 63 years old. And I, you know, I, I got to do something to kind of keep going. But I'm into it. I'm working at, in other words, getting chiseled. And it takes work. And it takes effort. So if you go back to that first verse very, very quickly and listen to what Isaiah says, he says, listen to me, my people, and give heed to my... Uh, I'm back on verse 4 again. I beg your pardon. It's popping up on verse 4. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. Look, this is calling for what? Effort. You listen and you look. Now, does it take effort to listen and look? Folks, it does. Don't come to worship and think, well, hey, you know, I, I'm just here to kind of let osmosis take over. You've got to be invested in it. I heard, I heard Vernon Eller used to say there are two things that make a good sermon. One is on the preacher, that, that he or she needs to present something that's worth listening to. Guess what the second part of a good sermon takes? Your willingness to listen. And sometimes I can give something that isn't too whiffy up here, but if you're listening, it still can be a great sermon because of what you're doing with it, taking it in and making it apply to your life. You might think, well, that's an easy out for me. Well, no, it's not. It takes effort. Getting chiseled. So, this is not a time for passivity, but it's a time for effort. And folks, the church really needs to be taking notice of this. Remember, fear produces lethargy. It produces apathy. It produces depression. It produces agitation. That's what happens when there is no effort. Fear keeps us from effort and hems us in. Get chiseled. The second thing, if we're going to get chiseled, you know, we need to trust someone. Guess who we need to trust? God, otherwise the sculptor. You saw the Michelangelo. Uh, uh, you know, and, and Michelangelo was saying something, I think, so profound. He said, when, when he took a block of marble, he said, the image was already in the armo. I, marble. I just released it. What do you think God is doing with us today, wants to do with us, if we trust him to shape and form us in order to send us? He's doing that. So it takes effort on our part. It takes trust on our part to trust what it is that God is doing. Here's the third thing. Know what God wants for us and through us. And I talked about that forever salvation. Folks, that... Hang on to that. That's really, really good. I, I, I've said it through the years. God's got this. God's got this. This COVID thing or any other thing that you're saying. My beloved sister, Joanne, right now, I'm saying God's got this. In the midst of your crisis and your crisis, whatever it is that you're going through, because we're his people, he's got this. And he wants you not only to know that, but then to express it. That's on you as well. Well, you want to end by saying this. In order then to get chiseled, go back, number one, and check the sources and resources you are presently drawing on. What are you drawing on right now in your life to build you up? There's a lot of junk out there that you can spend time on that might be actually tearing you down rather than building you up. And I'm finding that a lot on the media these days. By the way, if you're a Facebooker, I challenged you last week. I'm going to con continue to challenge you to do this throughout this coming year this next year. And that is this. When you get on there, 
Look to build someone up. Speak positive. Offer a word of hope or assurance. Take delight in who they are and what they're about. You don't have to agree with them on everything, but you do, as a follower of Jesus Christ, have to love them. Build them up. Because you're hewn out of great material. That's who you are. Secondly, don't give in to the tyranny of the moment. We're, this, this, um, this virus that we're going through right now is a virus of tyranny for many people living under its influence to the point where they are completely petrified. Forgive the pun. I thought you'd pick that up, Keith. Petrified. Okay, rock, petrified. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just having fun. But that's where a lot of folks are at. So fearful that they can't move. Don't give in to the tyranny of the moment. And the third, receive this message for your life now. Folks, it's time that God's church start trusting God, and believing in God for the God he is. He's delivered in the past. He continues to do so, and he will in the future. He will. Well, with that, I'm going to ask that you join me in a moment of prayer. Father, thank you for the blessing of this day, for these who are here, for the message that you've given to us from both the gospel writer Matthew through Isaiah, the words that uh, come to us from antiquity that speak to us where we are right now. Help us to take courage. Help us, O oh Lord, not to be depleted by an encompassing fear that moves us to lethargy and apathy and depression and agitation. Help us not to buy into that, but rather to look to that which gives assurance, which, which is certain, which fully establishes us in a hope that is lasting because you are a God who is faithful. Today as we worship, we do want to lift up these persons and the needs that have come before us today. I want to remember Irwin and pray that you would give him healing in his hip as uh, he's, he's struggling. Pray for Joanne and Steve in light of her recent diagnosis. Matt and Anita, good friends and colleagues, and I pray for your comfort to be upon them. I pray to you, Lord, for the cases of COVID, certainly that are taking place nationally, even worldwide. But we know of neighbors and friends who have been beset by this and hospitalized. So we offer them to you. And then, Lord, as school opens this week, protect our students, our teachers, our administrators, for we hold them to you and pray for a good year in the midst of all that's taking place. Bring about the good, the hopeful, that which grants assurance and certainty. Well, we pray for that. And now, as we are about to leave this place, Lord, help us to go from this place without fear, but assured in our life with you. Thank you, and for the promises which are forever. And as we pray, we lift up the prayer which Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay. Now, I think um, I'm going to call singers on up at this point, and I think we're going to li leave on, on uh, a musical note that's just kind of stamping the exclamation mark on what we're about today. If you're going to go, and you go without fear, and you go with assurance, and you go with hope, that translates into going how? In peace. Go now in peace. So we're going to sing this thing as a round. And uh, this side, I want you all to stand. You start out. These, we'll give you a good start, all right? And we're going to follow up over here. And we'll sing it twice through as a round, okay? Go now in peace. Go now in peace. Okay, well, we're going to leave with this. The image of the rock. What is a rock? What, what's one characteristic of a rock? It's hard. Another characteristic? It's strong. Another characteristic? It's old. It lasts. That's good. No, it's great. It lasts and it's strong. How long is this thing going to be around? Long, longer than we have been, both from beginning to end, right? Okay, and guess what God says? I have hewn you from this rock. I've done that. You're mine. Just real quickly, I, left a I met a friend the other day, and he told me, he, he, you know, I walked into the room, and he said, hey, guess what? I just got over COVID. And I looked at him, and I said, why didn't you call me? And he said, well, Listen, I didn't want to call you to frighten you. I said, no, 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 no. I'm not frightened. I'm not frightened to sit down next to you right now. I'm not. I'm not scared of that. You needed to let me know so I could have been there for you. Church, that's who we are. We're to be there for the world. Because we're this. We're this stuff. Right? Right? Isn't that good to know that's who you are? All right. Let's go rock. Let's go rock the world. Rock Quinter, okay? Amen. Grace and peace. Bye. <laughs>